Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us for another session at ICFJ's Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. I'm David Moss, the manager of IJNet.org, which is a project of ICFJ's that publishes tips and resources for journalists working all around the world and is now available in eight languages. I'm thrilled today to be joined by three really incredible photojournalists. First, we have David Rodriguez. He's an award-winning visual journalist based in Salinas, California. He uses a solutions-based approach to build community in his hometown. He works at the Salinas Californian and is a Catch Late Local Fellow. Also with us is Camilla Ferrari. She's a multimedia visual storyteller based in Milan, Italy, and her work focuses on the emotional and physical relationship between human beings and their surroundings. Ferrari was featured by Artsy as one of 20 rising female photojournalists in 2019, and she's been published on National Geographic, NPR, US News and World Report, CNN, and more. Finally, we have Todd James. He's a senior photo editor for National Geographic Magazine. He has a passion for creating highly visual narratives. Over the past two decades, Todd's work has been recognized by World Press, Pictures of the Year International, the Society of Publication Designers, Communication Arts, the Society for News Design, the National Magazine Awards, and the Webby Awards. Our panelists are joining us today for what we hope will be an engaging discussion on photojournalism's role during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We'll discuss the importance of visually documenting the crisis, the unique challenges photojournalists face in their line of work today, and we'll dive into some ethical considerations around photojournalism during this difficult time. This and hopefully much more. Before we begin, a few quick points. If you're a journalist on Facebook, but haven't joined our forum group yet, please do. You can search for ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. If you're not on Facebook, we have a mailing list that you can sign up for to receive updates on upcoming webinars. Just go to icfj.org, scroll down and click on the covering the COVID-19 pandemic page. During our session today, please feel free to type in your questions for our experts into the Zoom chat, which you can open by clicking the chat option at the bottom of your screens. If you're watching from Facebook Live, just type the comments below and we'll make sure they get onto the Zoom chat. And now let's get started. We'll be running today's webinar just a bit differently. I'm sure you all actually want to see the great work that David, Camilla, and Todd have been involved with. So, to start, I'll turn it over to each of them for some quick presentations about their published photos on COVID-19, and then we'll dive into our discussion. So David, I'll hand it off to you first. Awesome, thank you, David. So thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is David Rodriguez. I am a photojournalist with the Salinas California, and I will be sharing my screen in a moment. Here, let me check it out. Cool. There, perfect. Sorry about that bit of technical difficulties. Can you guys see what I'm seeing right now? So I will be running through some photos that will focus on the work that I've been working on throughout this pandemic. The photos that I'll be showing you right now are basically some of the photos that revolve around the farm workers and the protests that I've covered throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they really don't relate to what I'm going to be talking about, but you, it'll, you'll get the gist of it at the end when I'm done with that. the whole transition. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so through the partnership of Catchline and the Salinas Californian, I've been working on a project that focuses on the struggles of essential farm workers and their families amid the pandemic. These farm workers are on the front line of an Americans food of Americans food chains. They help stock the shelves of our local grocery stores throughout the nation and are and throughout the country, yet they themselves lack accessibility to food. And this is one of the focuses that I'm, that I'm honing in my project on, these racial disparities that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Salinas is kind of known by many as the salad bowl of the world because of the immense ag industry that kind of, that it's around the city. Um, <clears throat> due to the need for food, um, farm workers have, remain essential. They've been working through the pandemic in the fields, 
close together, wear safety precautions and um, like face masks and hand, hand washing were slow to be implemented. Today, um, Latinos and farm workers make up 80% of positive COVID-19 cases in the county where I currently live and I'm covering, um, which conversely uh, relates to only 59% of the Latino population in the county in the general population in the county. Uh, so seeing that COVID-19 cases are rising and that 38% are in the ag industry, I really gotta ask myself, and we all gotta ask ourselves this question, what will happen to the world if our food supply, you know, our farm workers fail? Through my work, I'm, att I'm attempting to show through my many photos along uh, ex uh, existing racial disparities that I have lived through my, by my, on my own and that, that COVID-19 has exposed and exacerbated, which is what the Black American community is kind of drawing attention to at the time with countless of protests across the country. <sighs> These systematic flaws that we live in um, kind of keep them vulnerable to pandemics and other injustices. So <clears throat> this project that I'm working on, it's a five-part series that will be in a specific, that will focus on specific racial disparities. I've published the first one that, you, that there you go. This is when I was kind of start taking control. Um, this far part, part series focuses on a certain family in Salinas, which is the Salvador family. Her and the, um, like the Salvador family, just like many immigrant families, are facing racial disparities from food insecurity, housing, income inequality, and education inequality. This is Resty Salvador on the left, and that's her brother, Aldo Salvador. She's kind of taking this parent role in the whole situation. When I first met the family, you know, I connected a lot to it because there was a lot of issues that they faced that I faced as a kid, from having to sleep in the living room, from having to depend, eat on, and sustain yourself on whatever you find at home. These issues that they're facing connected us deeply and quickly. Um, so back to, as you can see, she, I'm kind of focusing on her life and her struggle on how she's trying to break this cycle of poverty that a lot of immigrants are stuck in. She's 19 years old and when a lot of 19 year olds uh, should be thinking about decorating their dorm room or should be thinking about, you know, what subjects they're gonna study or what their career is gonna look like, she's focusing on her brother. She's focusing, she's making sure that her brothers don't fall, that don't follow that same fate that her parents are working on low income jobs and kind of, she's working on a better future for them. Um, this is Jesus uh, Salvador, that's the youngest. He's the most spirited kid out of them all. And I, as you can see in this photo, she's, this is something that Latinos and I'm pretty sure other families are, are very familiar with the, the chancla and she's taking this parental role on kind of disciplining them if she has to and just showing them like hey, that she cares about them. So here as you can see um, in this photo she's kind of making the transition from her room to the living room due to many immigrant families in order to kind of offset rent have to sublet and so those, the ranchers are coming in and into a household that's already filled. So kind of upping up that number and lowering that social distancing. And she's moving to the living room. Um, and this is where she will kind of be staying for the remainder of the future. This is Melodon, the father. And yeah, this is Jesus. And this is the whole family. The mom is missing. And yeah, that's my project so far. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna click on a quick link because I know I'm running short on time. So and I'll end this. Are you guys able to see? This is a story that this is the first story out of the five part series that was published. We this can't see this, David. Oh, cool, cool. And actually, yeah, for the audience, uh, we shared the, the link to this story in the Zoom chat, so you can definitely check this out. Perfect. Uh, are you guys able to see it now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. 
So this is the first story out of the five part series that focuses on the food insecurity aspect. When I first met the family, um, I didn't take any photos for the first two hours. It was hard uh, as a photographer, that's like my first instinct. But I knew that, especially during these times where everyone's weary about just talking to anyone, I knew I had to earn their trust and I had to show them what I'm about. And talking to the dad, I quickly understood that, you know, as I, as a child, face constant struggles of maintaining that food for your family. And as you can see here in this photo, um, Melitone's feeding a cherry to his son. And yeah, uh, there are many like, layers and nuances to this story in this project, but I hope that my elevator pitch kind of got you hooked into what I'm working on. And I hope that in this short time, you've kind of gotten a look into a window of these complex generational issues that have kind of plagued families, immigrant families for generations. So yeah, thank you for your time and please feel free to check out this beautiful story and keep a lookout for the remaining four stories in the series. And thank you, Catchlight. Hey, awesome. Thanks so much, David. That's really great work. And now I'd like to turn it over to Camilla, who uh, she's based in Milan, which has, of course, been one of the pandemic's epicenters. And she's really taken on a, a really unique approach uh, with her photos. So Cam Camilla, would you like to share your screen? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for watching this webinar and thank you for having me uh, here. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Can you see what I'm saying? Okay, good. Yeah. So before showing um, this gallery of images, which was published in uh, new US News at the end of March, uh, I wanted just to you know, give a little bit of background on um, my work during the pandemic. Because as you mentioned, David, Milan is um, in, in, in Italy, which was one of the first, first countries that was hit by the virus and especially my region, which is Lombardy, was one of the most uh, heat regions in, in Italy. And when the epidemic started, pandemic, but epidemic at that time uh, started, I um, really started to question my role as a photographer and how I could add to the visual narrative about the virus that was building um, every day. Um, and I, I was, you know, reflecting on the, the, the decision of some colleagues of mine who rightfully so went outside to photograph what was going on and the unfolding consequences of the pandemic, which were, you know, rising drastically every day. And, and then I, I stopped for a second and I thought, okay, but what, what can I bring to the conversation? What is, how do I feel about this pandemic? Um, and of course, this means that I speak from a position of privilege because I had a home to stay in the whole time because some didn't have the chance to stay home and had to go out and work. Uh, and also for some people being at home wasn't easy at all because you know we are not gonna explain it of course here, but uh, for some reason, for some people being at home wasn't um, a viable solution, let's say. So starting from there, I thought, about the psychological effects of what it meant for me to being at home and the double uh, symbolism around the home. So on one side, it was a way to detach from people outside. So you were confined at home, but at the same time, it was a way to reattach yourself to something that um, hosts you every day, uh, which is your house, which is the four walls when, where you sleep at night, where I slept at night. And so I started, um, browsing my home and trying to find uh, relief through the rediscovery of simple things in daily life and banal things of the daily life, which is something that I, um, it's part of my practice uh, in photography and video. So it's something that I was already doing. I, I was already photographing my house and my life and um, my relationships and myself. Uh, but I, what, what I thought it was interesting during the pandemic was the different way that I was approaching uh, photographing daily life, even though it was something that I was already doing. So on one side, when I showed these images to people, um, 
my hope is that for people who are in the same context, it gives them a sense of what we have and what we have the privilege to have uh, and a different way to live the pandemic and trying to find the beauty in everyday life and a shelter in, in a home. But on the other side, it was also a way for me to find a way to wander without moving from my house. And so trying to create, a, let's say, a psychological uh, shelter in my own house where I could explore and sort of travel without moving. Uh, at least this is how I, uh, I felt I was, uh, I was going to, to do. So as you see, these are all details from the, the two, first month in quarantine, actually, because this article was published at the end of March. Um, and as you saw, there, there are a lot of self-portraits uh, in this series, um, but they are always very much um, atmospheric and non-literal in the sense that I wanted it to feel like it, because this is an autobiographical work that um, I'm there, but at the same time, the self-portraits could be any other person, uh, woman, any other person. So I didn't want them to be specifically about me or my life, but more as something that some people might relate to. Um, so yeah, so after the article was published, I kept on working on this project. Um, so I've been working on it for the whole pandemic, the quarantine time, so for three months. But I'm just showing you this um, little piece of the work um, for this presentation, and I'm gonna stop sharing and end it here. All right, awesome. Thank and, you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, that is incredibly unique work. Um, and now I'd like to uh, bring in Todd, who has been involved. Uh, he'll speak to a project he's been involved with in Detroit. So Todd, you wanna take it? Uh, you're, on, you're on mute, Todd. Um, so thank you very much for uh, including us in this conversation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, we all found, let me see if I can get to the top of this, which is where I should have been. <laughs> Excuse me one second. So, you know, we all found ourselves kind of in a, in a similar situation and we all have kind of responded to it in different ways. I mean, the, the National Geographic has a tradition of taking people on enlightening journeys for like 132 years, but we, we typically sent photographers uh, around the globe to, to tell stories and suddenly we weren't able to send photographers anywhere. And the same story was uh, that everybody was interested in was um, uh, it was the same everywhere. It, it, it had a commonality. The pandemic was spreading around the world. Um, so we, we kind of quickly pivoted. We're, we're not a news organization by any means, but um, this uh, certainly was uh, uh, an important and evolving story and we want to cover it. So we We've always sort of treated photographers as, as, as authors and, and photography as a kind of a specialized language. And we just had to kind of look and see where were our strengths for telling the story. So we all kind of contacted our networks of photographers in different places and said, you know, what, what does this look like where you live? How are you, what, is, what are the stories that you're seeing, um, you know, where you live and what are the stories that you want to tell? One of, the, um, uh, one of the photographers, and we were basically doing this around the globe, uh, many, many uh, photo editors like myself, reaching out to, to, uh, to photographers and, and giving them one week assignments. You know, we called them photo dispatches. And, and so we were, we, were, we were gonna cover this and the globe in a, in a, in a different way. And I think it's been pretty successful. I'm, I've, I've been happy with the results. One of the um, one of those stories and photographers is the one I'm going to show you today, Danny Wilcox Fraser, who lives in Iowa. Um, and I had worked with Danny on a, a story about water in Detroit uh, at one point. Um, uh, and uh, I didn't bring up Detroit with him. I just asked him an open ended question. You know, where do you where do you see uh, COVID's impact in you know, where you live, what is it, where you live, what does it look like in your backyard? And, and he mentioned a couple of things to me, uh, but said he would be really eager to go to Detroit because he just, he knew, we already knew Detroit was, the infection rates in Detroit were high and we were beginning to understand that um, the impact of COVID um, was going to disproportionately impact people who have the least. Uh, they were, the people who have the least were gonna suffer the most because they have, uh, uh, lower economic, uh, um, the resources are, 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 
are more limited, uh, the social safety net is more limited, um, and, and, and certainly we've seen that play out. Um, this, by the time Danny got to Detroit, you know, really important, you know, people were dying alone. Uh, uh, important rituals of saying goodbye had been dramatically altered. Uh, the number of people who could attend a funeral surface uh, was often limited to, to 10 people. They were spaced uh, out um, uh, for their own health and safety. Um, but this was, you know, this was just overnight had, had sort of impacted the, the cultural rituals and the daily uh, rituals of our lives. So Danny, I think, did a, a remarkably good job in a week. Uh, he, he had a groundwork, uh, I mean, a, a network of, of, of people because he'd worked there before that he was able to draw on. Um, I think these are some remarkable pictures of, um, you know, the tragic ways that sort of COVID has, has, has affected people's lives. Um, not only death, but how you say goodbye. And, um, and, and I think he did a, um, a very, Nice job. I, I, the other thing I will sort of call your attention to, and I would encourage you if you have a few minutes and you're interested to to take a look at the link on this story, but you'll see that this is not this is not drive by uh, photography, right? I mean, if in, if you need any any evidence of that, you know, look at the, look at the caption on this. <laughs> you know, it's arguably maybe a little bit long, but everyone here has a name. Every it, you know, this is a very collaborative process of storytelling. You know, it's not he's not. You know, he's not sort of, he doesn't live there, but he's worked there often. He's very well acquainted with NGOs. Um, so he's got, a, he's got a framework of understanding and a network of support. Um, the people are, are individuals. They're not, they're not stand-ins. They're, uh, they're people that, you know, Danny gets to know and talks to and is, are comfortable with him photographing and know who he's photographing and why. And so I think you see that. I think you see that trust and that relationship and that intimacy. And I think that's really, really important because I feel like this is, you know, all of the ways that we tell the story are important, but we have been telling the story more than any story I can remember from a data point of view. And why? Because it's invisible and we don't know much about it. And we talk about curves and we talk about are we flattening the curves and what is the infection rate? And, you know, all of those data points, those are people, right? So I think this kind of work is really important because if we're going to have an empathetic response to how this is affecting people's lives and who it is affecting disproportionately, I think we have to see in the first person present tense way who we're talking about and how it's affecting their lives and how they are not uh, afforded uh, some of the privileges that I am, frankly. Um, so I think, I, think this is, I think this is an important, as is the data journalism, uh, as is every form that we can use to tell the story. But I think what, what, you know, photography is just a technology, right? So it's, you know, when I talk about this, this is about the photographer and this is about the values and the, and the story that the photographer can tell and has the, the ability to tell and the ability to gain trust and to respect the people that he's photographing and to want to collaborate with them to tell their story. So that's the, that's the end of that story. And um, I guess we're going to maybe take some questions. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Todd. That Thank you. Really uh, incredible work. Um, yeah. I'll remind our audience and our viewers to you know, type in your questions if you have any for, for our uh, photojournalists in the Zoom chat or on Facebook Live, and we'll, we'll try to get to them as best we can. Um, but to start, I want to, I'll bring uh, David back in here. Um, uh, you know, you and you touch on this. You touched on this when you were presenting your photos, um, and your work. You know, it focused on communicating some of these inequalities we're seeing that COVID nineteen ha has exposed in, in different communities in the U.S. Um, so, what power does visually documenting this important aspect of the crisis have, in your opinion? Yeah, no, visually documenting these inequities that are being amplified because of COVID nineteen. It's important because. Once you're, one, you're capturing history, but two, you're creating awareness by pulling back this veil of long existing inequities. So <clears throat> kind of creating a, a level of human connection, people can relate to the subjects and connect with them because most people are experiencing food insecurity right now. They're experiencing fear of a uh, lost job. Um, so you're kind of connecting them 
to my subject, which is the Salvador family. They're, they've been experiencing that, but now more people throughout the country get a sense of what it feels like to live that life. Um, so documenting the people who, and hopefully, like my, my hope is documenting these people struggling kind of creates a sense of empathy in lawmakers and just your average Joe and, and helps us prepare for future crises. So we know where to invest our money. We know where, what to do if there's, God forbid, another pandemic. Yeah. Awesome, David. And I know, Todd, your, your work has also, uh, you know, touched on these inequalities that COVID-19 has really put front and center. Um, do you want to weigh in on this? You know, what, what power does visually documenting this? I mean, you mentioned the data journalism. Yes, that's aspect but the visual mm -hmm. photos present another i mean i i agree with, i agree with david i think the um I, I i firmly believe that that you know journalism is the first draft of history um uh, it's it's it can be uh it's imperfect but it's it's an important uh recording uh of what is is going on um photography to me you can't do photography from a cubicle you know i mean there's a lot of journalism today that's done from a cubicle at a distance and you know you cannot shoot pictures that way. You have to you have to show up. You have to go um, to to where the story is to to make those pictures, and 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 you have to put yourself out there. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, and I think um, you know creating that visual record. Um, I, you know I would echo what David said. You know it's we are human. You know if we if if we need empathy to get us through this, I think we relate to. Um, the condition of, of other human beings. And if we, and we, I think we are more aware than ever um, that I recall in my lifetime of, of the need to kind of shift our perspective and our assumptions. Um, you know, we all, I mean, that's a, that's a work in progress. I, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm doing that all the time and I'm doing that in real time on, on trying to cover these stories. Um, so I think, I think this is, this is how we raise awareness uh, of what is going on, how COVID is impacting people's lives. Okay, awesome. I want to bring in a, an audience question now, and maybe I'll direct it to Camilla first. Um, we have one from Varsha Tawari. Um, they're asking, uh, what were the challenges you faced when you were ready to photograph, and what was the thought process behind each photograph? Uh, thank you for the question. So for me, um, since um, I decided to focus on the inside part of uh, the pandemic, I made a conscious decision not to go out and, and photograph because I was very much uh, interested in the psychological effects that this pandemic had uh, on me personally and um, on other people as well because I to be completely honest, I felt very much frozen uh, to the idea of going outside and um, and risking the health, not only my health, but the people I was photographing as well. And then the family I was encountering after, uh, you know, being outside. And uh, I think it's so necessary that photographers are out there and doing this. But at the same time, I think it's also very much necessary to be very honest about our intentions as storytellers and why we are photographing something and what is our true intention and for me the psychological aspect of being confined at home was something that really drawn uh, my attention so um, I decided to focus on that in the hopes of bringing a diaristic narrative uh, to a condition of confinement that a lot of people were sharing with me as well and also um, again, complete honesty, the fact that being confined was seen as something, um, I mean, a lot of people complained about the quarantine uh, in different ways in different countries, but the people who had the privilege to be quarantined complained about the fact that we were stuck at home. And for me, doing a work like this was also a way to say, you know, focus on what you have and cherish what you have, which was something that I was doing as well while I, while I was doing this work, um, you know. So finding beauty in everyday life is something to cherish, uh, in my opinion. Great. Thanks, Camilla. And you you touch on the the safety aspect there. I think it would be a, you know, that's obviously got to be top of mind for photojournalists. So much of your work, you you likely have to be in person. I mean, Camilla, you found a creative, you know, approach to your work, but um. I want to direct this toward David. I mean, you're literally in the homes of the 
of your photo subjects um, during this health crisis where, you know, we're, we're warned about even being indoors. Um, so I'd like to ask you, how did you navigate these uh, the safety concerns, both, both in terms of Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, somehow uh, I don't No, know. both, yeah, go on. No, it was tricky at first um, to fight the instinct to get close to people because as journalists, that's our job, to get as close as we can um, to our sources, to connect with them on a human level. And it's very hard to connect with them if you have a face mask. They can't see your intentions. They see someone with a face mask, get close to them and, be like, and point a recorder or a photo or a camera. And it was difficult. Um, so kind of getting used to waving them down and talking to each of my sources from a distant and socially acceptable way took some work, but understanding the health guidelines that, that were coming out and seeing how other people understood them as well truly helped with this. Seeing when I went out, seeing who was wearing a face mask, seeing being situ like aware of my surroundings when it came to a crowded area, where can I where, what can I avoid? Who can I avoid? Who can I not avoid? If I need to talk to that person, where can I take that person? So my, myself and that person could be in a good place where we won't be exposed to anything. <clears throat> so understanding the health guidelines was a huge, huge help. And um, I have a bit of an OCD. So after every, every assignment that I've shot on a daily basis, I would clean my gear throughout, I have my isolated area in the corner in my house. So I would clean my gear, making sure none of my gear touched my anywhere near my kitchen, my living room, and take off my clothes, put them in the hamper, and just put it near that area. Because it's important to be aware of that as well. Um, and I guess one of the best things for peace of mind is a travel size hand sanitizer. I could vividly remember the emotions I felt when I didn't have that hand sanitizer. After every assignment, I would get in my car and I would clean my hands. When that wasn't there, it was a bit of a disrupting feeling. But yeah, scoping out safe zones and scenes in any room and knowing common health guidelines became second nature after a while, so yeah. Yeah, great. And Todd, uh, in your role as an editor, what, you know, what special and extra considerations have you had to take on, you know, as you're commissioning pieces? Well, I mean, I mean, I think that again, we we're all, it was a pretty steep learning curve for all of us, you know, and we're, when we're learning in real time and we're getting, um, you know, the science is changing where we're, 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 the guidelines are changing as we're going along. Um, but we have, um, you know, we have our own uh, guidelines, which are pretty much mirror the CDC guidelines. We, those went out with our assignment contract um, so that we were we were making photographers aware of what our expectations were for them to um, kind of in a formal way for the, for their own safety and the safety of the people they're photographing. So we had we had that to start with. We um, and then I spent a lot of time on the phone um, with Danny Wilcox Frazier and um, including like when I we first he decided he wanted to to do this assignment. I said, look, I want you to talk to your family about this because this is no joke. You know, this is, there, there are some real risks here and I, I want you to make sure that you're comfortable and your family's comfortable with you doing this and let's talk on Monday. So, I mean, that's a, to me, that was just kind of a, um, the way I was ethically comfortable with uh, approaching assi this assignment with a little more care than, than I might have ordinarily. Um, we were ap able to sort of provide him with some, uh, some P PPE, um, we, um, I sent him links to uh, uh, webinars that sort of talked about sort of how you stay, keep your equipment clean and how you create hot zones, the things that David was talking about. We went over that. He, he, you know, the first night he got, you know, to a hotel, he spent the whole evening cleaning down the hotel and then he created a hot zone in his room and the equipment didn't move past that before it was, it was wiped down. But, you know, these makes, the, these make the days very, very long, you know. And, um, but it's important. It's important for his safety. It's important for the safety of the people he's photographing. Um, you know, you just, you just have to inform yourself the best you can. Uh, you have to be a good partner uh, to the photographer and, uh, and help them with whatever they need help uh, to do the assignment. Gotcha. 
And Camilla, you're a, along these lines, you're a freelance photojournalist. And obviously your work, you know, you were able to do from, from your home, but in terms of how, how have you been able to balance the need to, to have work commissioned during this pandemic while also, you know, taking into account your own safety and well-being? Uh, you're on mute. Let's see. Okay. Okay, I couldn't. I couldn't unmute myself. Um, so, so yeah. Actually, during uh, the lockdown days, I went on assignment for a publication, and the assignment included me going out to photograph. It was a, the beginning of the pandemic, so uh, they were creating videos of the cities uh, completely empty. Uh, since the majority of the population wasn't outside, and my assignment was to, you know, um, create this content for the city of Milan. Um, and the way that I approached this was pretty much what David and Todd said. Um, and I was also much reassured by the fact that I my my goal was to photograph emptiness, uh, which meant that my relationship and interaction with other people. Uh, were as low as they could be. Uh, but in terms of, for example, gear, I was very much aware of where I was walking, what I was touching, where I was, you know, putting myself to, to balance, for example, because it's something that, we, at least for me, it's something that comes very naturally when you move uh, and photograph, you touch a lot of things that you never noticed. Um, and so right now you're very much more aware of your presence in space. Uh, and so again, when I went back home, as David did, I had a place in, at home before even going in. Uh, I cleaned up everything, alcohol, like everywhere, every gear left it there. I had a tripod, so even there, like the tiniest uh, spots in the tripod. And in my car, I tried to, you know, divide the car as well uh, and leave some space free from the objects that I would use outside um and yeah and trying to balance this kind of work with the autobiographical work that i was doing at home yeah um, and i'd like to bring in another audience question now um we have one that's directed toward david um how do you ensure that your journalism is giving power to your subjects while photographing them during this vulnerable time period uh, no thank you kate simini i've seen that question and it, it's a very important time for people because we as photographers tend to be seen as vultures. That's why when I, we go in, take the shop, that's why it meant so much what Todd was saying that Danny takes the time to um, list, talk to their, to their source, talk to their subject and humanize and add, and add some human level to his photographs because that's what I feel so important. Um, making sure when I'm with my subject and I'm photographing them, I'm constantly talking to them. Now, before it was easier for me because I would constantly take a photo and show them the photo and tell them what it meant to me and get their perspective in and to like, does that work for you? And I, I tend to get a lot of feedback from my sources. Um, when I do that, I tend to get the, the best moments. I know that's not best practice, but having that constant dialogue with my sources um, tends to lead to better moments. Um, so whenever they do see themselves in the camera and they're like, well, I didn't know I looked that good or I look really confident in that photo. It, I, I hope it gives them that sense of power of, wow, an image could show a side of me that I never knew I had. So that's, I'm hoping that answers your que question, Kate Simini, but yeah, that's, Oh, thanks. Thanks, David. And I actually want to uh, direct another question Todd's way. Um, you know, we have some viewers asking, asking us to weigh in on the, the ethical aspects and considerations of, you know, photo work during this time. And uh, of course, we wanted to talk about that as well. Um, and you, you have you have photojournalists at Nat Geo, you know, out and, you know, documenting this crisis. And obviously, it's a really sensitive time and difficult time. So uh, and I believe you touched on this a bit during your presentation. But how are you balancing the need to, you know, get these important photos out while also respecting the privacy and the, you know, the sensitivity of your photo subjects. 
Well, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think it's, I think there is, uh, I did allude to that, is that, is that this is a very, uh, particularly these assignments, you know, um, the ones that I've been most intimately involved with are, there was this one, there was another one sort of in a hospital. Um, you know, the, the ethical, you know, the, ethical sort of guideline of fairness, right, is, 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 is what has to sort of, um, sort of be maintained. And um, particularly with anything that relates to someone being sick or possibly being sick or wearing a mask, we're very, very careful with that. Um, we actually, I think, have releases on everybody in every one of the stories. So we were, we made sure we had their informed consent. They knew what we were doing. They knew why we were doing it. They knew it was for possible publication. Um, and they, after hearing the explanation, sort of consented. Now, we had to actually come up with an ethical way to get an ethical consent. In hospitals, you can't be passing paper, right? Because you'd potentially be passing COVID. So we, on the fly, came up with a way to do a video release uh, that would that would do consent in a safe way, but we and then our our legal team has been reviewing this. We are all of our coverage is uh, is in this time is really heavily reviewed going in the door, out the door, and coming back in the door. We have global security team that's looking at it. We have a legal team that's looking at it. We have a questionnaire that we have to fill out for every assignment we do, so that they're aware and it has to get checked off. Uh, when stuff comes back in, uh, we've got releases it gets legal review it's, if it's sensitive. And basically anything or almost everything is sensitive at this time because anything that even implies that someone might be sick is a private matter. Great, yeah, thanks for weighing in on that. And uh, I'll pull in another audience question. This one's for Camilla. Um, what inspired you to make use of your home? Was it purely out of necessity? You know, um, can you go more into that? Uh, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, actually, I, I mentioned uh, shortly this thing before, but for me, photographing my home and my life and my daily life uh, has always been part of my practice and my area of interest, let's say, because I'm very much fascinated a bit by uh, how simple yet powerful things, very banal things uh, that we go through every day. Uh, are and how they impact our life and our personalities and us as humans and uh, so it kind of came naturally during the the quarantine time to to keep on doing this but but again it had a different intent uh, because when I mean I'm realizing this by looking at the images and rethinking how I was approaching this uh, quarantine uh, diary while I was doing it and the it wasn't only the intention of documenting and highlighting the everyday life, but it became more like a, a process of reattachment to, to my daily life uh, and refinding myself in, in my home. So it wasn't just documenting uh, what I was seeing, but was creating a space for myself through the images and like recreating an atmosphere um, and a sense of wonder that I needed at that time to to get relief and get you know a way out in in some ways in fact a lot of images that I took were of windows uh which is pretty you know a pretty obvious uh, symbol during a, a quarantine time but for me the, the windows were very interesting because not only they were they were the only division between me and what was outside but they were also reflecting a lot. They were reflecting my image, they were reflecting what was inside, and they were merging the outside with the inside of my house. And so they created this different layers of reality that I was able to see without moving from my home. I hope it answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And uh, we have, a, we have, we're getting a lot of uh, audience questions, which is great. And this one, I think, could be for any of you. Um, how do you, how do you manage to keep your, uh, you know, your objectivity while working on your respective projects, especially when it's so easy to get overwhelmed during these, you know, especially difficult times. And maybe I'll send that to Todd first. 
So I guess the only thing I would say is, um, well, I guess there's two parts of that. And I, and I kind of get a little hung up on the objectivity uh, piece of that because objectivity, I, I realized that this was sort of um, an important standard of journalism at, at a certain time, but I, I feel like we are increasingly realizing that's uh, hard thing to achieve and that what we need to be is fair and accurate. Um, so um, I'm not sure about the, uh, the objectivity part. I think you, you have to kind of do everything you can to make sure you don't have blind spots. And of course we all do. There's, we, it's, you know, we all have, we all have biases that we, unconscious biases that we don't know about and maybe conscious biases that we do know about. So I think you have to constantly be listening with an open mind and checking yourself and trying to inform yourself so that, it, you know, that you're, you're making good decisions about the stories you're covering and the way that you're covering them. Um, and uh, it's been hard. It's been hard. I'm working a lot of 12 and 14 hour days, but so, so are all my colleagues. Um, we've had to learn how to work remotely. We've had to learn how to cover um, uh, this, this very important story on a global basis in a very different way than we usually work. Um, you know, everybody's, we're, but we're all in this, we're all in this together, I think. And, um, and I think we're, I think we're just trying to learn in real time. Great. Thanks, Todd. And yeah, I know objectivity is really top of mind for journalists, especially right now. Um, we're running out of time. We have about 10 minutes left. I want to uh, bring in one more audience question that is kind of a, you know, a really holistic view, uh, you know, asking for a holistic, you know, look at how COVID, how COVID-19 will affect photojournalism going forward. And maybe if you don't want to weigh in on the whole industry, you know, maybe your own personal work, how it's going to affect your own personal work going forward. And maybe, but do you want to uh, speak to that? Um... So for me, what's very interesting is the fact that COVID, uh, and Todd mentioned this um, quickly before, uh, the fact of being in a situation, right? And being present and being physically in a situation to photograph. I think during COVID and during the pandemic, what really uh, surprised me and um, in a weird way excited me was the need to find solutions. Um, and uh, the the need to find uh, interesting solution to a common problem, which was the this same presence, right? So uh, a group of of us photographers are out there and documenting in real life in person, and then there's another part of photographers who are trying to find ways to kind of innovate photography. So for me, it will also be a matter of the significance of the term photography and what photography really is. Because if we think about some examples that I saw of people photographing through Zoom, for example, or photographing through Skype, is it photography? Uh, is it not? Why is it photography? Why is it not? Who's the photographer then? Is it the person who screenshots the screen or is the person who frames the screen, right? So for me, what's really interesting is I, I would hope that a debate on the meaning of photography might arise from from this situation. And, and that's why also the intention behind what we do is so important to answer the objectivity question very quickly. For me, maybe objectivity can be replaced with honesty. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that this will bring this debate as well. Um, not only in photojournalism, but in photography and visual arts in general. Awesome. Thanks, Camilla. And David, I want to pull you in on this. How, how will COVID-19 affect your work or in your view, how will it affect photojournalism just in general moving forward? Um, <clears throat> trust and access to stories, to families, to, re to just our sources. So I, I feel like that's going to take the biggest hit in my perspective. Um, because it, it's already for anyone hard to trust a stranger to come and document your life and for that for you to have them believe that you know that this will create some sort of change that you hope it creates some sort of change but now that you're battling that trust that you kind of have to build you're also battling their health issues 
and not only their health issues, the health issues of their ma mother, the health issues of their grandchild. Um, there's <clears throat> this per source, I'm not gonna name who she is, but she's gonna be a part, of, I am hoping she's gonna be a part of this five part series. She's an incredible spirit, she's going through so much, but she's been very hesitant to have me come over because she's more than open to have me there, but she's living in a one room, of more, she's renting a room and living with her, uh, with her grandson and her sick mother. So even though she wants me there, she's like, okay, my, mom, my mother's not feeling well today. So David, I don't think you could come today. And this, this has been like a month of um, constant contact with her. And she still, to this day, I'm going to meet with her today at 1.45 p.m. At PM Pacific time. But to this day, she's still fighting that constant struggle of like, should I let him in? Can he come today? Is today the right day? And so I feel like that pandemic, the pandemic, that's what we're going to have the toughest time. Access Great. To. Thanks. And Todd, how about, how about yourself? What, in your view, how will this change photojournalism? Well, I think, I think, I don't know whether it will change photojournalism universally. I think it'll certainly change the way we work at the National Geographic. But if you think about it, we've been doing it since 1888. We've had to change, you know, a lot. I mean, you know, we, we, uh, the nature of transportation and how you would, we would send people off for a year at a time, you know, at, at a certain point in our history um, to document parts of the world that weren't, uh, weren't well known to our readers. Um, the internet has happened. There's, you know, we've had to, we've had to transform the way we think about what we do and what the nature of a story is and the nature of knowledge. I mean, if we're taking people kind of on these enlightening journeys, we have to, it has to change with what people know about and need to know about and want to know about. So, but I think really more fundamentally, so I think, I think we've had to be nimble throughout our history and we've had to change with the culture and the technology um, and, and really what people are, are curious about. So, um, so I think that's in our DNA to change. I think we have uh, abruptly had to kind of rethink how we, uh, how, we, how we cover the world, right? And we've had to do it regionally because no one could travel. So I think that will stick. I think that we will, we have been moving in that direction for a long time. There was a time in our history where we sent photographers out from Washington, D.C. to cover the world, right? And I think, I think we're going to, you know, we're, we're very near a model where s stories from people who are regional and sort of know, know the stories better than someone uh, perhaps arriving from Washington, D.C. from a different culture. I think we're, this, is a, this is an important uh, and, and, and optimistic moment, right, for that shift to take place where storytelling will be more regional, the way we think about assigning, the way we think about telling stories, and that people, uh, you know, not exclusively, but we will, we will, we will get a much uh, more robust uh, sort of diversity in terms of the stories we're telling and who's telling those stories. Great. All right, great. Thank you all. And I just want to, you know, end on one final question of my own. Uh, you know, we have five minutes left, and I just I'd love, I imagine we have a bunch of photojournalists tuning in for this, and I'd love if each of you would just share your top line advice for four photojournalists who are out there covering the pandemic today. Um, David, what, what is your top line advice for photojournalists out there? Um, so my top, top, top uh, advice would be just to remind yourself that this job takes guts and resilience. So if you're new to journalism, pandemics, riots, um, you don't want to lack the training and result in that being your last photo of something happening where you weren't ready for the moment. So there's plenty great organizations doing free online work webinars right now that you could kind of look into and kind of start to educate, kind of start educating yourself on what I can do to stay safe. So I don't know. So top top advice: always go with a buddy. If you have a brave buddy who kind of you know you could count on, so he could be watching your back while you're photographing some photos, and just being situationally aware of everything. COVID nineteen has kind of heightened these senses to being aware. Okay, what am I touching? What am I not touching? 
when I'm, when I'm in a protest, I know where I should be. I know where I should be standing. I know if I'm inches from getting, I, I was close during my last protest. I was photographing the, these gentlemen kneeling with their fist in the air. And I, I saw a car coming my way, but I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure I could evade. I'm pretty sure the car's not gonna hit me. And so one of the protesters pulls me in and I'm like, I appreciate it. So even though you're sure that you're safe and you've been doing this for a while, no, always be aware of your surroundings and yeah, educate yourself. And uh, the international, real quick before, the International Women's Media Foundation is hosting a webinar on Friday about just first aid. Um, I'm gonna post it on the link. It's just, ah, uh, gives you some training tips on what to do during a riot and a protest. So if I was, if you're interested, definitely join in. Awesome, thanks, David. How about you, Kanoa? Yeah. What's your, you know, very top line advice for photojournalists today? Um, for me is question your motive on why you are photographing something and um, why is it, how, what can you add uh, as a photographer and as a person to the narrative of what's going on? So for me, and it comes back to what we were mentioning before, honesty. So be honest uh, with the subjects you are photographing and first of all, though, with, with yourself and your intentions. So that would be my advice. <laughs> Great. And Todd, how about you? Well, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier that I, I, our approach at the National Geographic is that is that we view photography as a specialized language, right? It's, but it's, it's a technology, right? So, but, but, but it's, it's, if you view it as language, then it's incumbent on you to know what you're trying to say. So I would say, know the story you're trying to tell, you know, be focused about that. Care about the people you're photographing more than your photograph. Your photographs will be better if you're thinking about the people and, and the story you're doing, and then the photography comes from that, right? If you get, if the, if the, um, if the photograph becomes the object of desire, right? Rather than telling the story, I think you've got it backwards, right? I think it, it's a means to an end. And, and then I think beyond that, I think you have to be fair and accurate and empathetic. You can have a point of view. I think it's, you know, I mean, that's the, the objectivity, which is a whole nother hour we could talk about objectivity, but, but know the story you're trying to tell, care about the story and the people in your story. Um, serve that, right? And then I think the pictures will flow from there. And in these times, of course, you have to sort of be informed and be safe for yourself and the people you're photographing and your families and your community. So you have that responsibility too. be responsible to the story, be responsible to your safety and everybody else's safety and, and know, and know the story that you're trying to tell. Great. Thanks, Todd. Um, and thanks to all three of you. That's really great advice. And just for sharing all your insights today, I think it was really, you know, an engaging discussion we had, and for sharing your work. It's really awesome work that all three of you have been involved with. Um, and thanks to everyone who's tuned in today. Um, please be on the lookout for a survey that we'll send out after this webinar. Uh, your feedback matters to us at ICFJ, and it's critical for these live events. Um, I'd like to highlight a great session we have planned for next week on Thursday, June 25th. We'll have four experts uh, to discuss the dangers of domestic violence during COVID-19. Panelists will discuss the factors that contribute to gender-based and family violence, reporting guidelines for such a sensitive topic, and avenues for potential research and reporting. Another reminder, we've launched a survey in partnership with the Tau Center to better understand how COVID-19 is changing journalism. You can visit icfj.org or our social media to take part. And finally, you can expect to see the full recording of this webinar on both ICFJ and IJNet's YouTube channels. We'll also post a recap article with some of the key quotes and takeaways uh, that you can use in your own reporting. And this will be published on both ICFJ.org and IJNet.org. And again, stay safe and thanks for watching. Thank you all. Bye everybody. Bye everyone.